Hi students, welcome to the Baidu Sindhu News Analysis for 11th of December 2018. So let's get started. So let's look into the first article. So the first article says RBI Governor Urijit Patel quits citing personal reasons. So what is the context here? So the Reserve Bank of India Governor Urijit Patel has resigned from his post making him the first governor since 1990 to step down before his term ends and Patel's three year term was to end in the year 2019 in the September month. So this is the context with respect to this article. So even before we understand and ponder deep into this article, let's understand the basic structure of the RBI. So the RBI basically has one governor and that was Urujit Patel and then we have four deputy governors. These four deputy governors are basically deconstructed into two types two are from outside and two are from within the RBI. So two from the outside premises of the RBI basically include one commercial banker and you will also have an economist. So you basically have four deputy governors, two from outside and two within the ranks of the RBI itself. And what we have to understand here is the central bank deputy governor can be appointed for a term of about five years or up to the age of 62, whichever is earlier. Now that we have understood this particular structure, what we have to get back is to understand what is the basic background and why did Urijit Patel go on to resign in this particular case. So the background seems to be the basic tussle between the center and the RBI. So the center and the RBI had engaged in unseeming tussles over number of issues which had a bearing on the RBI's autonomy. So what I want you to guys to currently look is we have already uploaded a video on YouTube in focus with respect to the RBI. So kindly look into that particular video in understanding the basic output of how the RBI works. But what we have to understand in this particular case is how is that the government as well as the RBI had a number of issues. What were their basic tussles? What were the skirmishes that these particular organizations had is what we need to understand. So the first point of importance is the demonetization was the major problem as to why the flurry of issues started. So demonetization was one of the things that the government took up. So the agenda was a very beautiful agenda. The agenda had in itself to fight corruption, the black money, to introduce the digital way of payments and also to make sure that counterfeit notes that were rushed across from Pakistan as well as Nepal and Bangladesh were completely dismantled. This structure was to be removed. So the agenda of the government was to introduce a number of things to the demonetization. However, However, the implementation and the output was completely disastrous and when you look into all these surveys and whatever the RBI has produced to the parliament, it is said that almost 99.3% amount of money has returned to the RBI. That is all those money that was in the market has come back to the RBI and this goes on to prove that demonetization as an implementation was disastrous. Though the agenda was very good but the implementation bit, the end enforcement bit was disastrous in terms of the economic activity as well as in terms of its implementation. So this was the major disruption between Urijit Patel that is surrounding RBI as well as the government. And then came the most important point and this includes the section 7 of the RBI Act. So this particular section 7 of the RBI Act is one of the things where the government would be able to enforce its stance on the RBI. So the RBI is completely independent. It has its own set of autonomy that will be able to function independently. But the minute section 7 is enforced, government would be able to dictate terms to the RBI. So this basically means that RBI is moving away from its independence and this basically means that government is pushing its agenda. This became a center point of all their tussles as well as skirmishes. In the garb of section 7, what the government also wanted to do was it wanted to basically push in its certain number of people on the board. Let's take the example the government wants to come up with a particular policy. So what will the government do? It will infuse 
few certain number of people who has a similar ideological backing so the people of the ideological backing with the government support will be put into the RBI board and then the government would be able to influence the decisions of the RBI so on one side the government wanted to take up the autonomy of the RBI away from it by meddling with the section 7 and at the same time it wanted to make sure that there are people within the RBI that is following the same ideology of the government so that it could influence the board recommendations at the end point the government recently had also asked for funding from the RBI and why did it want the funding basically it wanted to make sure that the deficit that the government had had to reduce and then there were state elections that were coming and next year we also have the central elections so it wanted to make sure that there were flurry of number of schemes and programs that the government wanted to introduce as a result it had also requested for the money from the RBI to reduce the deficit so this also became a question of debate and the most important point that we also have to understand is the number of resignations so when you look into the resignations right Raghuram Rajan who was one of the most important and the well-known economist who was the ex-governor also did not continue with the government and then you also have the Niti Aayog vice chairman that is Panagriya who also resigned and then the chief economic advisor Arvind Subramaniam also resigned so what this means is the central government did not let all these officers and the people to act with autonomy they did not give them the basic independence they did not let them function with utmost integrity so these are the basic tussles that could have happened because of the RBI as well as the central government tussle now what we have to understand is the most important point is what could be the implications what is the most important point is that once this decision is taken what could be the possible impact what could be the implications because of Urijit Patel resigning from his governor post and what we have to understand right now is when we look into the structure currently the senior most person in this particular architecture is Vishwanath so he'll be taking up as the governor until the government comes up with a suitable name so the first important impact is that Mr. Vishwanathan will be the governor as long as the government is able to find a suitable replacement for Mr. Urijit Patel and once we what we also have to understand is this could have a negative impact on the RBI team how is it going to have a negative impact let's take the example of Viral Acharya. So Viral Acharya had come up with certain proposals that the government is interfering with the RBI autonomy and what this means is Viral Acharya was also a close confidant of Urijit Patel and what this will finally do is this will discourage all the deputy governors and the people who are working within the RBI to work efficiently now that the government has meddled within the affairs of the RBI what this means is the deputy governors as well as the employees working within the RBI are discouraged they'll be demotivated because they are not able to take an independent stand for the autonomy of the RBI now what they are asked to do is that they'll have to give up their independence and this will be a kind of a discouraging effect we saw that there were flurry of reactions flurry of people who actually went about resigning and what this also marks is a sign of protest and what is the protest that we are speaking about we know for the fact that government is a huge entity it has a political backing and you have a normal person who is intellectually good who wanted to do something for his country as well as the RBA autonomy at this point what we have to understand is there have been previously number of IAS officers who did not want to give up their work but instead as a mark of protest as a sign of revolt all they had to do was get into a different department or resign their job role and this means that there were certain amount of things that were going against their ethics against their value system and that is why they're going for this protest and what this means that the independence was completely dismantled there is constant interference from the government and that is why Urijit Patelji went on to protest why because he didn't have the freedom to expose himself central government was acting on the autonomy of the RBI that the next person whoever is appointed as the governor is it going to be a person who says yes sir yes sir approach is basically means a committed type of bureaucratic model so is the central government 
trying to enforce a committed type of bureaucratic model on to the person who is coming up next so it means that the central government can also appoint a person who just says yes to whatever calls the central government wants this basically means that the autonomy of the RBI will be completely dismantled so the third important point is there could be a possibility of yes sir approach model or committed person or a committed type of bureaucratic person in place in the governor's positions the rating agencies let's take for example the Moody so what basically happens in the credit rating agencies is it looks into the institutional sovereignty the institutional strength what is the independence what is the autonomy how is that this institution is able to act independently in spite of the pressures of the central government so when the rating agency or a credit rating agency looks at this is the assessment of the institutional strength that is how effectively efficiently is the RBI working in spite of the pressures but what is currently happening is this can actually impact the RBI and this can also impact the rating of India because the institutional strength is completely dismantled right now because the central government has made sure the autonomy is kind of disturbed central government or any government for that matter is more into short term growth they basically believe that there needs to be a lot of development within the span of five years they do not look at the long term approach what could be the possibility what could be the implication five or ten years down the lane but it is the RBI which looks at the growth prospect in the future and we currently also have the election season coming up so what the government is also discounting is in the guise of the short term growth what they are forgetting is the long term inflation effects and that could be a possibility in the future so these are the possible implications that we have to understand in terms of resignation of the Urijit Patel and what does the government have to do what is the conclusion that we have to understand is the fact that the government should take it as an example and should not treat the RBI as any other government department you can have number of departments you can have the bureaucracy you can have the committed bureaucracy so the government bureaucracy can say yes to their approach but here the government has to understand that RBI is not any other department and the governor is not a bureaucrat so it has to give its independence it has to give its autonomy and basically make sure that RBI is given that operational autonomy so that they are able to function efficiently keeping the prospects of Indian economy and not in the guise of a political party so this is what we need to understand in reference to this article so moving on let's look into the next article so the next article says London court orders extradition of Malia so what is the context here it says chief magistrate Emma Arthanot on Monday ordered businessman Vijay Malia to be extradited to India and referred the case to British Home Secretary Sajid Javed for signing the extradition order so Mr. Malia will now have 14 days to lodge an appeal so the first point that we have to understand here is what is the basic meaning of extradition let's take a simple example so there is a person and this person who is violated laws he has committed crime he escapes the eyes of the judicial conviction so he absconds the home country and he goes to another country so the home country makes a request to that particular country which has currently hosted him so that that host country can return this person who is absconded from the home country so the person here is Vijay Malya so he happened to abscond the law books so from India he goes up to UK so India is making a request to United Kingdom to please send back Vijay Malya so that the law could be enforced so this is the meaning of this particular extradition and what is the law that is backing up this so what we have to understand here is the law that is backing is the extradition act of 1962 so when India makes a request to United Kingdom basically it can ask the accused in the three types of cases one in the form of under investigation then in the form of under trials as well as those people who are convicted criminals but what we have to understand in this particular case is let's take for example it is an under investigation in such a particular case those of the enforcement agencies which are currently looking into this particular case on a prima facie will have to give them substantial evidence 
to prove that it is this person who has committed a grievous crime or he has violated certain laws in the home country and what we have to understand in this particular case is who can make an extradition so who can actually go about asking for the extradition is it the state government is it the central government is it the general public this is what we need to understand so according to laws it is the CPV division of the Ministry of the External Affairs which can make for the request so it is the central government especially the Ministry of External Affairs alone which can ask for the extradition so the state government will not be able to initiate it the general public will not be able to initiate it it is the Ministry of External Affairs which makes the request to any other country and then we will have this particular person deported back to India so the next important point that we have to understand is which countries can India make an extradition with for which what we have to understand is there are two types of countries one we have entered into a treaty with this particular country so India would be able to make an ex request to all these countries to make sure that this particular person is actually sent back another thing is that India does not have any treaty with this particular country in such a country what we basically mean to understand is we go on a request let's take for example there is a country called as X we do not have any agreement agreements within this particular country so what we have to initiate in this particular case is we have to go with in accordance with the domestic laws as well as the procedures and what works out in this particular case is the assurance of reciprocity so what is this assurance of reciprocity so basically means it is an exchange offer so it basically means that we are actually making sure that we will be sending one person from home country of India to that country and we are requesting that country to make sure they can extradite their process so that they are able to send back the person that we want in the home country and what is the most important point is what are the international accepted conditions so when we look into the conditions what the international model has or what are the, that the international countries expect what we have to understand is that there are certain principles that is coming into picture so the first important point is let's take for example the principle of dual criminality so what is the principle of dual criminality here let's take for example there is a person who has committed a crime and it is a crime in India as well as in United States of America only when a person commits a crime which is a crime in the home country as well as in the hosting country that becomes the principle of dual criminality so it is a crime that a person has committed which is actually a crime in both the societies but now let's take an example now that the three, section 377 is decriminalized let's say India had not decriminalized section 377 India has not decriminalized section 377 but it is the free world in United States of America you would be able to have the LGBT rights in United States of America but India has not decriminalized it and United States has a free law so in such case dual criminality will not picture because it is not a crime of LGBT in United States of America but in India it is wrong to suppose yourself in the LGBT community as previously so what we have to understand understand is this dual criminality basically believes that this person who has committed a crime should be the same in both the countries and the next important point that we have to understand here is political reasons so what is the political reasons that we are speaking about let's take for example there is a person who is in political party and there will be difference of opinion if this political person has actually asked for asylum in another country such person will not be extradited so in case there is a dis harmony in the views of a political person in case a country asks for this particular person who has seek the political asylum in another country such person will not be extradited and the third important point that we also have to understand is capital punishment so in case there is a capital punishment in the home country then majority of the countries which do not endorse capital punishment let's take for example Australia Canada or Mexico then such countries may fail to ratify this particular treaty and they may not actually extradite this particular person and at the same time what we also have to understand is there are certain terms and conditions or evidences that a particular home country provides to the host country in this particular case in case there is a particular person who is charged of an offense that is not mentioned in this extradition treaty then again the host country may not send it to the home country so these are the general principles that we follow on a uniform basis and 
why are we discussing all this it is because uk has actually ordered the businessman vijay malya's extradition so these are the events that we have to understand kindly look into it so what are the options that are left with vijay malya so what he would be basically able to do is he would be able to approach the court of appeal and once the court of appeal is also done up with then he would be able to approach the supreme court so as of now the magistrate has given its judgment but then he would be still be able to file in the court of appeal as well as in the supreme court so this is what we need to understand in reference to this article so moving on let's look into the next article so the next article says no tax on withdrawals from nps so what is this article all about it's speaking about the national pension scheme so first point that we have to understand is this national pension scheme was introduced in january in the 2004 for all the government employees where about 10% of the basic pay will be taken off from their salary and it will be deposited in an account and this will be given at the end of their retirement and this will be in the form of annuity as well as in the withdrawal but post this again in the 2009 this was further amended and this was open to all the citizens so in 2004 it became important because it was open up for all central government employees and in 2009 any indian citizen would be able to come up under this national pension scheme so this is important for us from the prelims examination point of view and there are basically two types of national pension scheme so what is it on one side you have what is called as tier 1 on the other side you have what is called as tier 2 so basically in the tier 1 you would not be able to withdraw the money that you have put up in this particular account until and unless there is an exceptional or a special cases so what is the exception or special cases in this particular case there is critical illness or for example the child's marriage so in this case they would be able to withdraw or else they would not be able to withdraw the amount that they have deposited in tier 1 however in tier 2 it is different it is basically like a savings account where they would be able to withdraw so in the first scheme they would not be able to withdraw in the second scheme they would be able to withdraw the money from and this is under the administrative control of the PFRDA and what does PFRDA stands for it is the pension fund regulatory and developmental authority which is authorized by the department of financial services under the ministry of finance so this are the important points when it comes to prelims examination another key important point is the eligibility criteria so who are the people who would be able to take this up so all those people within the age group of 18 to 65 years would be able to subscribe to this national pension scheme and the most important point is even nris can actually subscribe to this if they are able to meet the kyc norms so all those documents that were required under the kyc compliance need to be mandatorily submitted and if they are able to submit it then even nris would be able to come under this nps however in case they actually lose on their citizenship then such people will not be coming under the np Yes. so this is what we need to understand however what this current article goes on to say is and the government on monday announced a slew of changes including increasing the government's contribution exempting withdrawals from tax and also exempting up to 1.5 lakh contributions to the scheme from the tax so what we have to understand in reference to this article is earlier we had a model called as the eet model so what is this eet model it basically means exempt exempt as well as tax so exempt on the first mode that is when you are making an investment into your pension scheme you are ex exempted from any taxation and next you have another e which basically means that you are exempted from taxation when there is money already in the deposit mode and the third thing is there is taxation when you are actually withdrawing let's take for example you have deposited about 1 lakh so when you are withdrawing this 1 lakh what it basically means when you are withdrawing the government would be taxing certain amount from this particular principal so this is what is meant by eet model so the earlier model for the 
NPS was the EET model and currently what the government has come up with is a model called as the EEE model. So what this EEE model basically means on the investment, on the accumulation as well as on the withdrawal, the government will not be taxing the amount. So what it basically means is once you look into the NPS, what you will understand is that there were two modes. One is the 40%, the other is the 60%. So this 40% which is usually given in the annuity model on a yearly basis which will not be taxed even before as well as now. But the 60% in the earlier model is again compartmentalized into two types one is the 40 percent the other is the 20 percent this you could have withdrawn on a complete basis on the complete basis 40 percent was again not taxable but this 20 percent was actually taxed but currently what the government has done is the entire 60 percent that you see in the one lakh that if you have deposited the government would not be taxing any amount and as we have previously discussed this will have about 10 percent of the basic pay from the central government employee salary that will be taken and put up in the pension front and what the government has currently done is it has increased it to about 14 percent so what this basically means is the 10 percent has been increased to 14 percent so 14 percent of the amount is detected from the basic salary of the employees it will be put up in this pension fund at the same time the central government will also contribute 14 percent to the funding so this is what we need to understand in reference to this article so moving on let's look into the next article so the next article that is important for us is from the prelims perspective which is speaking about the passes so what is important for us to understand is that there are various passes in the Jammu and Kashmir this can be a prospective question in your prelims examination so the first important point is we understand where is Jojila and Jojila is on the greater Himalayas and then what we have is the Banihal Pass and Banihal Pass is in the Pirpanjal range and then we have the Fotula and Fotula is in the Zanskar range and finally what we have is the Kurdangla and that is along the Ladakh range. So this can be a prospective question in your prelims examination. This is also part of your NCRTs so kindly expect a question from this. So apart from the passes that we have just discussed we have also have to know the passes of Jammu and Kashmir as well as the Himachal Pradesh. So so kindly pay heed to this picture this can be a potential question in your prelims examination they can ask you to arrange from east to west or from west to east north to south south to north anything can be asked in your prelims examination so kindly pay heed to this one and the most important of all this is ones that we are discussing now one is the Shipkila then you have the Rotang Pass the Baralacha Pass as well as Changla the Chardingla the Zojila as well as the Banihan Pass so rest of it have a clear picture of this because this can be asked in your prelims examination as well so moving on let's look into the next article so the next article says center reject minority religion status to Lingayats so even before we understand this we have to understand a brief background and that is in reference to the Baswana so who is Baswana here so Baswana is a social reformer in the region of Karnataka and then he was a social reformer in the 12th century and this happened during the era of Kalachuri dynasty King Bijala so during the reign or the rule of Bijala one what you will see is there was a lot of disturbance in the society so the society was divided on the caste basis in the form of Brahmanical values and then what this ultimately ended up with there was lot of gender discrimination superstitions rituals and because of this there was alienation of certain section of people so what Baswana does is in order to overcome this social bias in order to remove this discrimination and gender bias he calls for universal brotherhood and all that he says is anyone irrespective of the caste that they are born in in case you want to follow certain universal principles certain virtues certain goodness within the practices all that you have to do is you will have to wear a ishtalinga so any person who is daunting it or wearing that ishtalinga becomes a follower of lingayats and this happens in the backdrop of his certain principles where he goes on to poetry in the form of vachanas so what are these vachanas this can be taken up as lines 
these can be taken up as poems this can be taken up as philosophical principles so any person who values universal brotherhood who believes in wearing the ishtalinga irrespective of the caste irrespective of its lines what you have to do is follow these lines of vachanas in case you are able to follow it then these people will be called as lingayats so who are the lingayats here it is all those individuals and people who believed in the principles of basavanna who wanted to make sure that there is no social bias there is no general discrimination there is no social discrimination who are wearing the ishtalinga and abide by the vachanas and universal principles of brotherhood it is these people who are called as the lingayats and what happens with time is the state government comes up with one of the proposals that these lingayats will have to be given the religious minority tag and there are certain pros and cons is what we need to understand in reference to this article so what these people who wanted the minority tag call for is buddhism is also assumed and was assumed a part of hinduism so there were number of things which was also taken up from hinduism and buddha in itself is also assumed an avatar of vishnu so while all this happened you always assume that buddhism is inherently a part of hinduism but you went on to give a minority tag status to buddhism and considered buddhism as a different religion and at the same time you also went about giving the similar status to jainism as well so when you consider the jain as a religion it was also considered a part of hinduism it was also considered a part of buddhism heresy so what you have done over a period of time is you have given this religious minority status to both the buddhism as well as the jainism and this happened according to section 2 of the minority act of 1992 but what we are asking is when buddhism was considered a part of hinduism when jainism was considered a part of hinduism when you went about giving this religious minority tag to both the buddhists as well as the jains why is that you are opposing this particular tag to the lingayats while lingayats are also assumed to be a part of hinduism they basically believed in the formless part of shiva they basically believed in the vachanas they believed in the principles of basavanna so why not equate basavanna with buddha and also give us that religious minority tag is what is being put across by this particular lingayat community however what we see in this particular case is that the union government under the ministry of minority affairs of the union government has rejected this particular proposal of the lingayats so why have they rejected this particular proposal what they basically go on to say is that lingayats have always been classified under hindu sect ever since the 1871 census that in case these people are gone ahead and given this particular status what can also be done is all members of the scheduled caste professing this particular religion would lose their status as sc along with the consequential benefits available with them so on one side the 1971 census always considered these set of lingayat community people as hindus and at the same time in case we go on to give this particular tag then all those people who are currently looked from the schedule caste perspective will also lose on the benefit and further this could also rupture up the entire society divide the particular society on the religious lines and what we will also see is many other communities within the hindu sect coming up and asking for the religious minority status and this could be a possible threat because the social fabric would be disturbed and divided and that is why we have not given is what the central government has gone on to say so moving on let's look into the next article so in this article what we are speaking about is the grigorovich class frigates so the most important point that we have to understand is this admiral grigorovich class are the guided missiles which are the stealth migrates and they also have an other name called as the project 11356 so what is it when you look into the context india and russia had entered into an agreement for the construction of four admiral class that is also called as the project 11356 where you will have the manufacturing of the guided missile frigates destined for the service in the indian army and out of these four, two of the frigates would be constructed in the russia's baltic coastoyan shipyard and the remaining two will be built at the goa shipyard on the technology transfer and what does these frigates have these basically will have an array of weapon system that include artillery guns strike missile as well as radar control air defense system and sources have also said that this particular frigate weighs about 4000 odd tons and why is this becomes important because previously upsc has also asked the way 
date of a particular frigate and that's why we need to remember this and at the same time what we also have to understand is these frigates can be armed with Brahmos cruise missile and apart from this this article further goes on to speak about the Indra Navy exercise and these are the bilateral maritime exercise between Indian Navy as well as the Federation Navy so from this article we have understood two perspectives for the prelims in the form of Admiral Grigovich as well as the Indra Navy so this is what we need to understand in reference to this article so moving on let's look into the next article so the next article says Kaiga in power unit creates world record so this is again important from the prelims examination so what we are speaking about is the Kaiga generating station so first important point that we have to understand is where is this Kaiga electricity power project so this is located about 56 kilometer from Karwar and that is in Karnataka region so this Kaiga nuclear power plant in the western Karnataka has created a world record for the longest uninterrupted operation of 941 days how by beating the record of this Haitian plant in the United Kingdom so this is a likely question in your prelims examination so remember that Haitian plant is in United Kingdom and then we have overcome this and now we have set the world record by functioning for about 941 days uninterrupted so this Haitian 2 unit is from the UAC had earlier record of the longest uninterrupted operation among all nuclear power reactors so this Haitian 2 unit is an advanced gas cooled reactor while the India's KGS-1 is a pressurized heavy water reactor so kindly know the key difference and what is the significance of this so what we have to understand is this basically demonstrate that the nation's capability in nuclear power generation technology of the PHWR had fully matured and proved the excellence in design construction safety quality operation and maintenance practices of the corporation so this will become the significant aspect and apart from this what we also have to understand from the prelims perspective is that Piquet Ring 7 Ontario is from Canada so these are the three important things one is from the Kaiga which is currently got the world record second is from Haitian plant which is from United Kingdom Kingdom and third is from Pictoring which is from Canada and the significant part is that we have established the construction safety as well as the quality of the operation so this is what we need to understand in reference to this article so moving on let's look into the next article so the next article is again important from the prelims perspective and what we are discussing is about two important parts one is the Pacific black book the other is the Manjala Godi bird sanctuary and where is this Manjala Jodi bird sanctuary it is on the banks of the Chilka Lake in Odisha another important point that is from prelims perspective is important is that this IUCN status of Pacific Blackbird is least concerned so this is all we have to understand in reference to this article so moving on let's look into the next article so in this article what we are discussing is about the COPE India 2018 so these are basically nothing but the international air force exercise that happens between the Indian Air Force as well as the United States of American Air Force so the first COP India was held in the IAF station in Gwalior in the year 2004 and currently we are in 2018 so basically what this will do is it will include the flight test practices as well as demonstration then there will be few lectures that will also be given on the subjects that are related to aviation as well so this is basically done to improvise the relationship showcase the efforts and commitment of two nations to free and open Indo-Pacific region so this is what we need to understand in reference to this article of COP India so moving on on. let's look into the next article so the next article is again important from the prelims perspective and what is the context so the context says the Madurai bench of Madras High Court on Monday wondered how Sri Sri Ravi Shankar's Art of Living Foundation was granted permission to conduct a meditation event on the premises of the Sri Brihadeshwara temple in Tanjavur and what is of importance to us is to know that Brihadeshwara temple is a key important architectural marvel from the GS1 perspective in culture so we have to understand the Raja Rajeshwaram or Peru Dyer Koil which is called in Tamil is a Hindu temple dedicated to Shiva which is located in Tanjavur Tamil Nadu it follows the Dravidian architecture so there are three types of architecture the Nagara the Vesara as well as the Dravidian and what this 
temple follows is the Dravidian architecture. It is called as the Dakshina Meru or the Meru of South and this was built by Raja Raja Chola between 1003 and 1010. The temple is part of the UNESCO World Heritage Site known as the Great Living Chola Temples along with Chola Dynasty era, Gangai Kunda Cholapuram Temple and Ariviteshwara Temple that are about 70 kilometers and this is built of the granite. The Vimana Tower above the sanctum is one of the tallest in South India. So these are the possible things that we have to understand in terms of the prospective question that can be expected in your culture as well. So moving on, let's look into the next article. So the next article that we are speaking about is the article which is the anti-GMO campaign. So recently we did come across one of the articles which was a critique of the GM crops and this was from leading agricultural scientist MS Swaminathan. So MS Swaminathan came up with one of the articles where he has questioned the efficacy of the GM crops. So he has said the GM crops has not been of that efficiency. It has not added value to the agriculture and he had given a scathing criticism as to how GM crops are not efficient in its productivity. However, in line with this particular article, what this author goes on to say is that whatever arguments that were put across by this particular scientist had certain flaw in the arguments. So what we will be understanding in this article is how is that there is a particular confrontation to this argument that have been put forward by the agricultural scientist MS Swaminathan. So what this article goes on to say is any technological advancement for that matter will have its own pros and cons and what we have to understand is we will have to take up the advantages that we would be able to extract from the advancement of the GM crop. So what this article goes on to say is the BT cotton as well as maize from the year 1996 to 2014 contributed to the reduction in the gap between the actual yield and the potential yield. Earlier, before 1996, you had the normal crops, the yield was not comparatively more, but with the introduction of the BT maize as well as cotton, the expected yield and the actual yield that is calculated has comparatively reduced. And what this further goes on to say is that there are number of articles that are published, number of peer-reviewed publications that have published where which have gone on to say that GM technology adoption has actually reduced the pesticide used by about 37%. It has further gone on to increase the crop yield by about 22% and it has also increased the farmer profits by about 68%. So there have been number of papers that have published which have gone on that apprehensive mode about the possibility of GM. But all these publications were given a constructive criticism in the form of giving evidences as well as facts that GM crops have served the purpose and apart from this what was also voiced in the article was that GM crops has certain health hazards as well as for the animals as well as for the human beings as well but there were certain data that we have collected from America as well as elsewhere where the BT cotton or the soya bean have not reported any health issues. So that particular argument that GM crops could be a health debacle is again siphoned off. So what this article goes on to say is that this particular argument that is put across by Swaminathan in terms of the yield, in terms of the pest control, in terms of the efficiency is completely wrong. Why? Because there are suitable number of evidences which has proved otherwise and it has been effective as well as efficient. So what this article further goes on to speak about is in terms of the BT cotton. So what we have to understand is even before the GM crop was introduced, the yield of the cotton was comparatively less. But when GM crop was introduced, what we saw was BT cotton had an increase of about 500 kgs per hectare, which was initially at about 300 kgs per hectare. So what this article goes on to say is that BT cotton which was giving a yield of about 300 kgs per hectare has increased to 500 kgs per hectare all due to the application of the GM crop. Yes, we have seen some problems. Yes, there are issues. For all these problems, what we have to do is we have to come up with the development of resistance program. And in case there is anything, what we can also come up with is certain pest management programs by stacking BT genes to fight these secondary pests rather than just looking 
looking at the negative side of the technology and what is the conclusion that the article goes on to say is that India has some of the strongest regulatory protocols and India also has number of scientists who are of international repute in case you are questioning this particular GM crop efficiency what you are questioning indirectly is the regulatory paradigms that have been set by the government you are questioning the scientists who are working on this monitoring process instead what you also need to do is instead of taking this as an organic whole as an holistic on an uniform entity yes there will be issues because of technology as we have discussed but this has to go on a case to case basis you cannot say that GM crops as a whole is completely wrong but instead take it up on a case to case basis understand the geographical conditions in case we are able to make changes and amendments let us do it but as a whole you cannot complete neglect the efficient factors that have been added by the GM crops is what this article goes on to speak about so let's look into the next article so the next article says natal homing so what is this this refers to the phenomenon where various adult animals return to the place of birth for the purpose of reproduction so what this basically means is there are some adult animals which are actually born in a particular place but they go to another place and then when they have to reproduce give life to their new life what they do is they come back to the place of origination let's take some of the examples so this is basically seen in all aquatic animals like the salmons or the sea turtles and when it comes to India what we can take up is the olive red turtles so these olive ridley turtles have their birth in India and then go all the way to Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean and again come back to the Gahirmata seashore of the Odisha in order to reproduce so the scientists basically believe that these set of species come back to the area of birth to give rise to their new ones is because of the olfactory which basically is to do with the smell as well as animals having geomagnetic imprinting so because they have this presence of geomagnetic imprinting as well as the olfactory issues that is why they are able to come back to the place of birth and what are the benefits of it and why do the scientists prefer that these species are coming back it is basically because that these animals believe it is an assurance of safety that is it is associated with the suitable the sustainable models because they were given rise into this particular birthplace they feel that this is a place where they are secure this is the place that there will be safety and that is why they would want to pass on to their young ones and that is the prime reason as to why they come back to the region of birthplace so this is what we need to understand in reference to this article so moving on let's look into some of the prelims practice questions so the coco islands is part of which country it is Myanmar so let's look into the map now so it is here it is close to the Andaman and Nicobar so kindly expect questions like this because previously UPSC has asked questions like this so moving on let's look into next question consider the following statements about various types of inflation disinflation is fall in general price levels of goods and services deflation on the other hand is a slowdown in inflation rate reflation is the act of stimulating the economy by increasing the money supply by reducing taxes which of the following statements are correct so the answer for this is three only so let's look into the explanation so the explanation says deflation is the general price level of goods and services and disinflation is on the other hand is slowed down in the inflation rate and the third question which is from the previous year question papers the jet aircraft fly very easily and smoothly in the lower stratosphere what could be the appropriate explanation there are no clouds or water vapor in the lower atmosphere there are no vertical winds in the lower atmosphere so both these statements are right and the answer for this is both one and two so let's look into the mains answer writing so the question says what is placebo governance explain or illustrate with examples so this placebo governance as a word was given by TSR Subramaniam who was the ex cabinet secretariat who recently passed away so let's try and understand what this placebo governance is basically about so governments frequently produce schemes which they know will not work to appear to be acting to appease segments of the citizenry so such frequent amendment and changes in laws are resorted to as proxy for addressing real issue of reforming the implementation apparatus so what this basically means that the government knows that a particular scheme or a policy or a program will not work effectively or effectively 
efficiently but in order to reduce the tension that is prevalent in the society they come up with a particular type of law they know for this fact that this law will not be implementable it will not be successful but in order to sympathize their and pacify the citizens they come up with a law and such implementation of law is what is called as the placebo governance so what are the examples it says subsidy schemes acting as palliatives are often resorted to knowing fully well that these only address some of the symptoms and surely will not result in the cure so we have come up with number of subsidies in the form of agricultural subsidy and recently we have also come up with one of the competitions within the states the Punjab, the Karnataka, the Maharashtra government have all given loan waivers ultimately all that they are doing is disrupting the entire economy the channel of macroeconomic foundations and what are they doing giving more of loan waivers this could have a macroeconomic problems but we are not looking into all this they want the immediate effect and that is why they come up with such schemes which is not good for the economy and the next example is the heinous and the horrific crime of Nirbhaya was temporarily addressed by establishing a committee under ex-justice while the crime against women still go unreported unrecorded uninvestigated and unpunished so what does TSR Subramaniam say in this particular case? He says when a grievance act is done where a horrific crime is committed, there will be appointment of a particular committee. So this committee will give its recommendations, but will this recommendation be adopted or enforced or implemented? Not actually. It will just bite its dust and it will not be implemented. And even if it is implemented, the enforcement does not happen at a full scale and then all those people will be still suffering. And what is that the government is doing? the government will come up with one of the dole in the form of an act and next he goes on to say right to education program is another shell project long on slogan and short of substance this are some of the examples that we need to give in order to substantiate this particular question so in case you have liked our initiative please do like on our YouTube videos and subscribe to our channel so thanks for watching all the best